enjoy. All right, then. Yeah, and uh, you guys go ahead and, you know, text the questions as, as, as you can anyway so we don't forget anything as we go along, even if we don't get to it right now. But uh, as Ted was saying, I think uh, the synergy here is between Dengelmeyer is known for site uh, ESD analysis of, uh, you know, facilities and and <clears throat> fixing issues that occur while you're building or using things. Um, what uh, Pragma has been doing for a while now is, is focusing on the development, design, and analysis of the product. So before it's dumped over the wall to manufacturing, what is going into it uh, to keep it from coming back over the wall. And so that's the big, you know, that's the good fit here is that uh, when you're having a problem in the factory, uh, the DA can can find that and, and then if it turns out it's part of the system level design or um, usage, then we can look at it in further detail to figure out what went wrong or why is it doing this. So um, you look on page two, um, the design uh, process that, that an engineer had to go through is started with almost no information to begin with. You have a device on your board you're trying to protect and for uh, adding protection devices versus you know shielding and getting keeping the keeping the pulse from from getting into the system but assuming that you've got holes in your system and you kind of have to have holes in a system otherwise it's just a box um, you know, when you're striking a, a port, how do you know what you need to protect that? And um, the sales and marketing people from on semi or NXP will come and tell you, you need to use our spiffy nifty transient voltage suppressor, and it has this B clamp performance. Unfortunately, that that uh, that that clamp voltage that they show you is measured in the one condition that it'll never ever be used, which is by itself. So around uh, 2005, companies started acknowledging, well, it depends on what you're protecting and how those two devices interact. And so the, the key issue is not what kind of IEC pulse is hitting the box, but what it looks like after it's been attenuated by the uh, TVS device and, and then uh, attenuated further by the transmission line to the to the device you're trying to protect. Um, so that's what we call the difference between device under test being the TVS device type thing or uh, the device under protection such as your ASIC or USB chip or what have you. So these all uh, kind of gave way to a further element which was okay we think we know that when you hit this node that pulse travels down and is attenuated and shows up at the ASIC looking a certain way. Um, but what really happens? So current reconstruction scanning was an extension of uh, or a, a reutilization of EMI scanning where we wanted to see what's actually going on in the system, which, is, which has been done at the chip level uh, for a while to understand, you know, exactly where the hotspots are, what's going on. But <clears throat> there's been uh, a lot of difficulty in, in, in seeing that at the system level. And um, companies like Amber Precision have made a business out of building uh, big, essentially converted EMI scanners to do susceptibility scanning and current reconstruction scanning. These two uh, techniques are what we're going to talk about today. and the um, the advantage over previous techniques is now you're you're really getting into what is actually happening rather than an idealized nodal spice kind of um, perception of what what is happening. Oh, what's no, no, okay, there we go. So these are what the little scanners look like. Uh, they're a robot arm with a loop or e-field probe at the end and you're either injecting 
a pulse into the probe so that you can localize an upset uh, glitch uh, or you're going the other way and you're pulsing the system and listening for where that pulse travels in the system and this this is what we're going to talk about today so the reason we need to do this on page four here um, you either have hard system fails or soft fails when you have a hard failure you've you've not protected your ASIC enough and it is blown up or your CVS doesn't react quickly enough uh, and and it, it clamps after there's already destruction or uh, the TVS device blows up and shorts and protects it you know falling on its own sword uh, but when you have a, a situation at the factory where the the uh, the field returns are going up or line returns or you didn't call who you know whose fault is that the system designer gets this thrown back in his lab and he's got two competing chip suppliers here who are both pointing the other direction so you send the ASIC back to the ASIC manufacturer and they do a FA on it and say sure enough you exceeded you you, you blew it up so you know at that point you have to start putting down more clamps diverting things you're in the ESD lab zapping it with a gun but uh, but what what is it you actually need to do to alleviate the problem because you're making assumptions about what's really happening um, and and then in problem two you have uh, what, what's even worse is latent failures the whatever's happening affects the chip except the system doesn't fail what your failure failure criteria limit so it builds up a weakness until some point it fails later on perhaps completely unrelated to an ESD pulse at that time and how do you know what caused it and when so the question is can you quantify what kind of energy is actually hitting your chip that may be causing latent or hard failures that are easy to, to find hard failures are, are no big deal because you can just follow back where the smoke came from right but a, uh, a latent uh, failure or a soft upset where the system just just freaks out and hangs are are much more difficult to uh, to uh, analyze. So with the uh, the second generation um, non paper analysis is uh, refers to I residual or the current that gets past the PBS clamp, and this is a this is fine except that. Uh, if you if you go back to I mean current days well, some engineers will actually look at this and say well I put TVS on it and therefore that shunts all the current and I don't have to worry about it up to whatever the TVS is rated for of course that's not how it works um, the TVS is rated up to a certain level by itself and it clamps levels given you know what it's tested at by itself but it has a finite uh, clamping resistance, a dynamic resistance, uh, and a, a uh, trigger voltage or breakdown voltage. So there will be some voltage and current in great excess of the VDD rail or below VSS on the ASIC. And that's going to be the pulse that you see at the ASIC. And it's going to do something. So. The, the clamps at the ASIC still have to uh, be have some margin to withstand this residual pulse. Um, when when you try to simulate this, um, again, it's a very simplified analysis, but you can actually do quite a bit. It's certainly an improvement over just zapping the device under test and saying, well. You know this clamp voltage is better than that one so it's good um, the interaction of the two if you're going to simulate it is critical to understanding how much uh, the ASIC is going to see for example 
if you have a the the ASIC or the device under protection may only be good for 2 kV HBM. Uh, the device under test may be 8 kV IEC. However, the the ASIC, if it has a very very low dynamic resistance or it clamps harder or it has a snapback voltage that goes way below, then even though the device under test is a much more robust part and and is protecting the device under protection can still be zapped. So for soft errors on susceptibility scanning we have um, this is a simplification of what the scanner would look like. In this case you've got a TLP pulser or a HMM pulser that is driving a loop probe which is scanned over a system. And so you have maybe 10 rows by 10 rows, and you, you pulse, uh, say, 1 kV at that point. Then you, if, it, if the system still works, you hit it at 2 kV and 3 kV. And again, you're not, there's no conductive, conducted pulse. It's a, an induced pulse into the system to glitch it. And what you come up with is a, uh, susceptibility, susceptibility hotspot diagram as shown above. It's that here are the areas, say in the red, which are will upset the the system if it gets a mere one kV in the probe at that point. Or the green areas, you can go all the way to ten kV and and nothing happens. So um, this is for generating soft errors and localizing exactly where they are, so that then. You start to see what are your what are your vulnerabilities versus what your susceptibilities are. Um, a this this hotspot map here shows uh, area C on that corner is the entrance of a PCI Express lane into a Ethernet chip, and what you have coming out of B is another uh, uh, another chip that's on that bus. And then at A, turns out where buried uh, strip lines come back up out of the board and go over to the main chip. So there's no vulnerabilities or susceptibilities between A and B because those uh, traces are buried between ground planes. And um, you also see that the that C actually on the chip with the big uh, um, Heat sink on top is actually more susceptible, um, and and the uh, essentially it's acting like a uh, antenna on top. So let's see, a little problem here. Okay, there we go. The uh, the probe resolution when you're you're doing this, the typically you know, what's used is, is a modified TLP which has a really fast rise time and a really slow fall time. Um, and you can see that in the, the bottom right side. Um, it's a 10 nanosecond pulse and a slow rise time, I mean slow fall time. And what that gets you on the left side there is if you're looking at the voltage that's induced into the trace as you're scanning across, you get a high positive glitch there and then because of the slow BIDT on the back end, you get a, a less voltage induced in the back end. So you get, it, it gives you a nice way to create a single glitch to superimpose on the signal within the system as it's running. Um, what, what this is showing is uh, uh, every half, um, so it's 500, half a millimeter um, steps. And you can see that on the top there, that gives you the spatial resolution as you get near a trace. So what you're inducing into the circuit depends on the geometry of the traces on the surface that you're hitting. So as you go, um, if you have a, a vertical loop and it's oriented in the X direction, as you go across, if the trace is lines up with it, then you're going to be able to uh, induce a, a voltage, a higher, you know, at the peak of this glitch. If you turn it 90 degrees, you're going to be, you're not able to induce a, 
inducted field into that trace. So what you end up having to do with an arbitrary board, it makes it very difficult to understand, um, you know, for, for any, just if you look at that trace setup before, the hot spots are related to however that probe was oriented with those traces at that time. So one way you can do that is, is take an X scan and then a Y scan and then you put them together uh, to see what it looks like. But ideally you want to uh, focus down onto traces that you absolutely know and you can calibrate to those. Um, so the next question is on the system level at susceptibility scanning, what is your failure criteria? What are they? So does it hang up and stop working? Or as it shows here, um, an LVDS port that is fine on the left, and then you strike it about 12 times, and suddenly the leakage current has gone up to the extent that the port actually still works, but the eye is closed down. Uh, you know, if, if your criteria is the system still works, in that case it still works, but it's obviously damaged physically. So you have to, you know, you have to fix your assumptions as to what are you actually trying to solve. And if you've got a latent field failure that comes back, then you need to start looking at maybe your, maybe your failure criteria in, in qualification were wrong. Um, so susceptibility scanning summarizes is essentially the inverse of EMI scanning. You're injecting noise in to see where are the places that are most likely to, to upset. And then once you find those, you can kind of understand you know, what's susceptible. And then if those are near an I.O. area, maybe they're a vulnerability. So in this case, you see here that um, these are two uh, display port to VGA dongles. And you've got well, the one on the left here is obviously much more robust. So both of these were run to the same high level and low level. And there are only a few little susceptible areas on this chip. Whereas on the other chip, obviously, when you bang the top of the chip, there's, there's a lot of coupling uh, areas and it's and it's very vulnerable but also the IO lines here these are uh, pull ups and pull downs that are easily coupled into so that's a problem because those are your digital pins that go to the outside world this one doesn't have that problem so much and it's it's on the these these pins that are actually susceptible turn out to be test pins that really shouldn't be accessible to any kind of strike energy outside the system. So, you know, in this case, not only do you see this and say, wow, there's a whole bunch more red here, but it's where the pins are and which ones are susceptible. And that's the difference between susceptibility and a vulnerability. So, um, so the, the other one that really relates to, uh, or the method that, that really goes back to the iResidual concept is what is actually happening in the system when it's when it gets a strike. So in this case, we turn the system back around one more time. We're pulsing the port, say the USB port, and we're listening with a scope uh, at each point through the probe. So when you hit that board in the bottom left-hand corner, you want to know where, where does the pulse travel. In the generic assumption, we believe that it hits the TVS then it goes down the trace, and then it hits the ASIC. But in reality, it's coupled everywhere. And when it hits both of those devices, it's dumped into a ground plane or a VDD rail, and it then has to return out of the system. So there's a, there's a much more complex reality to what happens than, than the simplifications. So um, it's hard to understand you know, immediately how these images come about. But what you can do is make a video with this of a time-lapse distribution of the charge as the strike occurs. And if you take this, this pulse on this little imaginary board here, we're going to zap this trace. And we're looking at 
three we're taking three or uh, three by three grid of sample and the, the key to this is that the pulser has to generate an identical pulse with identical timings every time and we we have to the trigger on a very specific time because we're looking at the difference say it's a 10 nanosecond pulse with a couple hundred picosecond rise time you know for for this to spatially make sense those all have to be synced very closely so if you look at these nine plots which are the ones that you would get if you're taking uh, have the probe in the X direction here and you're, you're listening to uh, each of these spots and we hit it nine times, these are equivalent to the, uh, the, the traces we may see, for example. So if you hit it here and you listen here, you're going to see a very, you know, attenuated pulse and it's going to be very quickly seen from here to here. If you look over here, you're going to see an attenuated pulse and it's going to be later because it takes it a while to travel over here. Um, again, you'll see these are, this is immediate. You see this, whatever, a couple of units, nanoseconds after, etc. So with these, with these data you can take and slice it up by time. So you'll, you'll take the, the zero time and then the first uh, transition and go to this around 19 now once you once you slice that up by time and this is not I mean it's intuitive but it's kind of hard to see it when you first look at the data um, you'll get to see the pulse travel across and so if you, if you take all these pulses remember the zeroth element of the nine nine traces you'll start to see a pulse that looks like this. And what you see is the pulse travel down that trace. And that's what we build with the uh, current reconstruction. So this is a video that doesn't work on GoToMeeting. But essentially, you can overlay these. So we take the current reconstruction, and that's the movie of the little pulse traveling across here. We take the hot spots, which we know of, which, which up in this area are super, super sensitive and this area here but in the middle not so much and when you overlay these as the video you actually see that this is the key area not this because you remember the pulse was traveling down that trace in the middle so it's going to hit this little susceptibility here and so the net vulnerability that would show here if this showed up is a uh, is, is this is what you need to look at and if we go back and look at that that would be that would be this chip Right? So, so if this is your big susceptibility and this is just marginally susceptible, the key thing about vulnerability is where does that pulse go through that is, is uh, vulnerable. So, um, you know, here, if you think about, this is an, an example of a, a problem where um, you strike a USB port and it upset the Ethernet Mac in the, in the chip and that's that's a problem so what we want to do is uh, current reconstruction on this while we're injecting the signal in here and we're listening with the probe as it scans across um, and again now there was there's a video on the web that I have the link here later on you can go look at and you'll see a really good example of this but um, what what happens is you, you you're going to strike it here and you're going to see the pulse travel through to the Broadcom ASIC here. And you'll notice that there it lights up some, some nodes here by the uh, hub uh, for the Ethernet Mac. And that's, that's, what, that's what's happening in this uh, system now. You know, imagine debugging this without the, the video of the tool. Well, you can imagine it very well because you couldn't see the video. So, so, um, so again, on I'm sorry, did somebody ask a question? No, somebody just rejoined the oh, okay. meeting. So. Okay. So, so now we look at uh, characterization versus qualification. When you uh, when you have the ESD gun, you it's uh, it's you know the guns were designed for qualification, not 
not for analysis or characterization. They generate a whole bunch of EMI spikes, and it's hard to instrument a system you're banging with the gun. So you need a way to be able to uh, localize and, and, and the TLP and or modified TLPs or HMM pulsers are really good for that because you can, you can barrel down your, your pulse right down the coax and hit the system and then listen around it without getting a bunch of extraneous uh, pulses in. Uh oh, what happened? We're stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you advance us? Oh, I guess I gotta give it back. Can you? Do you have yours? Well, uh. Oh, there we went. <laughs> okay. Oh, we went up. There we go. Okay. So again, this is a an overlay of what we we're talking about, where you take the susceptibility scan, which is these are your susceptible areas on the board. Um, you take the current reconstruction that says this is where this is the path where the current we see goes without, for example, TVS. No TVS here, and it goes in and it also leaves the the system or the, the ASIC that's on this side and goes out to the memory chips and what have you. So when you overlay those, you say, okay, this um, is not only the the susceptible areas, but it's the susceptible areas that may see current from a strike over here, and therefore these are vulnerabilities. And if you take and and of course this is just a, a mock-up, but if you if you put your TVS here to, to block it and shunt all that energy back here, then you minimize how much energy shows up in these susceptible areas. That's that's intuitive, but when you actually see the fact that when you when you bang it here and there's pathways that you didn't expect, like the Ethernet MAC there, um, then that that quickly gets you to the point of solving the right problem rather than assuming maybe if I put bigger and better TVS on here to clamp it harder, I'll solve my problem. Well, in fact, in that case with the uh, small little router that was a problem because as you made the TVS clamp harder, it dumped more current into the rail and bounced the MAC harder. So the more protection you put on, the worse the problem got. And when you're doing the scanning, you can see that. So here's a, here's actually a, a, a couple of the, the slides that are in that video. And this video is showing, uh, this has several, probably 500 points total, roughly. Um, and it's, it's 30 nanoseconds deep. So you've got thousands of frames and 500 pixels or, or um, points to look at. And this shows you in great detail, you know, here's the trace. It even shows you as you climb into the BGA here, it shows you going through the substrate onto the die. So, um, and again, it's, here's the here's the path that you're going through. So if you don't have TVS, the pulse comes in, lands on the board, comes down the trace, and it irritates some of these other places here. If you do put TVS, you can see that it dumps a big current density into the ground plane, and that has to go out somewhere. And then this would be your little ghostly residual pulse in there. Uh, but you can see that, um, you know, the, the the idea here is you've got to fix this little this little problem here. So um, this is an animation on the website. You know the thing is how accurate can you get with this? And it's pretty accurate, um, even with the resolution of the probes that you get coupling adjacent to where you are. If you do the steps small enough and you use a uh, you know uh, depending on the bandwidth of the probe, etc you can get extremely fine resolution even through the chip. So um, in this case, you could pretty much narrow it down to it turns out a block of, of pins related to a certain phi are, are the problem. But what you also see out here are things you might not expect, such as this area right here, which turned out to be some, uh, some pull-ups for a test port, which were were actually more of a problem than anything. It turned out in this in this case that 
when you'd zap anything and the TVS diodes would would dump current into the board that that these pull-ups were too weak to uh, keep the, the device in a in a functional state and it would go into a test mode so you know you, you find all these fun little things that draws your attention immediately to things that you think you've already uh, dealt with and so it's it's really good at, at resetting your assumptions so the next generation that we're uh, we're looking into just as a look ahead is the uh, PEAT, so uh, integrated scanning. Um, we go back here and we say, wow, I sure wish I could know if I hit uh, this pin on the system, uh, w w which, which pins on the device are actually feeling it. So this is a susceptibility scan where I'm going physically over it, but what I'd really like to know is if I hit uh, USB the D plus pin, what all pins feel that on the chip? And so we're working with some partners to, to uh, propagate uh, essentially some simple little well, sensors in each I.O. cell that monitors when the ESD clamps go off and how hard they go off, uh, or, or even if you just have a single level to know that they're, they've exceeded, you know, breakdown or or a snapback that you can see this this pin got hit when and by doing that imagine if you're you're kind of doing it the way the susceptibility scanning works and current reconstruction it's it's sort of a combo because if I take my little Buck Rogers ESD gun and I hit the port that I'm testing at 1 kV and nothing happens and 2 kV now I get a couple of pins going off and at 3 kV I get damage, uh, but I get uh, damage on, on pin 12 here, say for example, but uh, some of these other pins are still not quite, they're, they're getting activity, but they're not uh, damaged. So now I've got a map that I can see on the board of where, what pins are getting hit and why, um, and I don't need a scanner. I just need to hook up to the uh, JTAG port or some test port to look at the look at the system after it's been that. So that's going to make things a lot easier because the limitations of a, either current reconstruction or susceptibility scanning is that you generally have to open the box. And once you open the box, it's no longer really the system that you were testing. So um, in embedded scanning, you have the extreme advantage of absolutely nothing changes. You hit it just like you do on the qualification table during the IEC test, and then you get information from it using the actual gun. So you're not, you're not injecting anything, you're not trying to create a certain pulse, you're not trying to orient a probe uh, to a certain orientation with the trace, um, all this kind of stuff. So um, that's really, you know, if you thought you had trouble now, not only can scanning help you a lot right now, but in the future it'll be even easier. And that's good because things are getting much, much worse. So, um, like I said, uh, with with Danglemeyer, what we're looking at is is when you have uh, environmental ESDs or or system ESD issues um, during the system development design. There's overlap here with Danglemeyer and Pragma design, being able to, you know, look at things on a grand scale in the factory, in the field, or looking at it during the design and analysis phase. So that's what we're trying to do. This is, if you want to go to there, that can, there's a little annotated video to show one of the uses of current reconstruction. And, uh, you know, is there any questions online? Uh, don't see any on the text. Yeah, we can open it up now for general discussion and questions. So please uh, take the opportunity to ask Jeff. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, there's one question. Um, on the 
current scanning slides that you show um, on the y-axis, I, I assume that's current current density of some sort? Yeah, the, the colors, right, that's, uh, that's current, or that's a uh, r relative current density. You can calibrate that to mean something for a given trace geometry and, and proximity. Um, but, you know, it, since the orientation and the, the, you know, the geometric response of the, of the probe as well as the spectral response, it's, it's not trivial to turn that into an extracted current in the trace. But it can be done, and there's lots of papers of people that do it. But when, when we do it for what you're trying to do, that's not really, uh, I mean, it's obviously sometimes necessary for figuring out what kind of pulse the ASIC sees and you know, trying to redesign, <clears throat> if you have to redesign the ASIC to, to handle some specific pulse shape. Um, but what at the system level you're usually looking for is relative comparisons. And so given the same scan uh, profile, those are definitely comparable you know, for a given system. And usually what you're trying to do is see, if I put this on here, did I make it better or worse? Okay, so you're just looking for relativity. So if you go back to the slide where you have characterization versus qualification, Right. Um, well, I think. I don't know why this. Oh, here we go. Yeah, right, uh, right there. Um, so the the bars from blue to red there. I guess that's all relative. So were you looking at actual traces? Uh, right. Trace right. of current density that goes through. Right. So you're just so looking at relative differences between um, having a TVS diode in this particular case versus not having a TVS diode. Right, and the spatial difference. When you see the videos, um, when you, if, you, if you take a look at the video that's on the web there uh, later on, um, you'll see how the, the, the issue is how does the current disperse in the system. That there's, It's a picture of a laptop, and it's got a fan hole right in the middle of the circuit board. And you can see the currents as they dump into the board and, and run around the fan to get to you know, to fill the capacitance up underneath the system and, and dump out the charge that way. Um, and, 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 and usually that's, you know, that, that qualitative issue of where, where is the path going uh, to tell you is the gasket connected or, or not making con contact or um, do I really have the impedance between this board and the ground plane that I think I do, uh, and that kind of stuff. So it's 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 for really, you know, in a basic sense here, you can probably calculate and simulate the I residual better uh, in in the simplified solution in order to see some of these bigger things where you have interactions all over the board and lots of and secondary discharges, right? Secondary discharges occur when you charge up some area of the board that then has a lower breakdown voltage that, you know, you get these very fast rise times and current, um, you wouldn't know to model that in your splice model because you, you, you didn't expect that to be out there, never connected to your, your system. And so it, it helps find unexpected paths like that. Oh, we're getting things. How do we get this here? Okay. Thank you. Things. Does that does that make sense, or did that did that answer any of your questions? <laughs> I just start talking. You know, that clarified some some things I had. I, I well, do you find you. that? I mean, do you think in in the things that you would be looking at, can you see where where that would be uh, uh, of utility um, versus just having a gun to to bang it and see if it pass fail? Yeah, of course I see the uh, usefulness of that, but let's say if I want, wanted to use this system to uh, compare, let's say, TVS diodes, say one manufacturer versus another, um, and, you know, so so I guess one one snapshot I would take is, is that actually with one particular diode manufacturer, which would have a certain uh, current or current density that would show up at, at the chip, so whatever the hotspot entering the, let's say, BGA would have uh, a certain shade of red, mm -hmm. and 
um, you know, let's say another snapshot would be uh, using the other TVS vendor, and that would have a different shade of red, let's say. So right. will we, I can make a comparative difference between one snapshot and the other and Absolutely. say that this diode is better because it limits the uh, current from going into the chip better. Absolutely, than and that's that, that's one of the thing. That's one of the slides that I, I took out of here to make it shorter. Um, we actually have uh, three, you know, three TVS suppliers that all have the same footprint and everything. And it was. It's actually a, a part that I had unfortunately a lot to do with, which was it, it's a dual stage clamp that has a one ohm resistor in series. So it's got an input, an output, and a series attenuator in the middle. And you you can't get any information off the data sheet about that that's, that's useful because uh, if you strike that part by itself, you're not getting any current through the resistor, so it doesn't really tell you how much it'll drop. So the only place it makes any sense is if you have a load behind it that's also conducting. And so the, the situation you're talking about is something absolutely we do all the time, which is, you know, measure, measure the, put the probe down there, and in, and in that case, you don't really need to scan it. You can to look at things, but you you know where you're looking at, and you just set the probe right on there, and try the three different parts, and you 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 get uh, false shape and everything, which is important because when you say is it better or worse, at what time, is the peak better, is the, the you know the 30 nanosecond time better, what's killing your part, is it the peak voltage, uh, peak current or or sustained current, total energy, that kind of thing. And so, so yeah, it's a, it's a good tool for that. And that with the probe that you can move, you don't have to build a new eval board. You could build an eval board to, you know, test that one over and over again and just probe it. But this way you can actually test it in your system. And that's, that's one of the key obstacles to really doing iResidual analysis, right, is how do you probe the current in the in the ASIC because what you really care about is not so much which TVS is better but which TVS works better with your ASIC which is not always the same so um, Ming says uh, how do you control the distance between the probe and the target being measured so there's multiple ways uh, one as you can see the since the terrain is uh, variable then there's going to be places where the probe hits a heat sink or something and is up in the air. Uh, so you have to think, and this is another problem with, with scanning, is that the, the terrain, the 2D map that you're looking at is actually a, a surface in the 3D volume. Uh, now you can also do it another way where you, you fly the probe <clears throat> maybe a centimeter off the board. So everything is a certain amount away from it. However, a tall part will be closer to the probe in that case than the others. So you have to, you know, you have to take this and and use it as a as as a tool to to know, you know, things like that that you need to be aware of. If if you have a part that's short and a part part that's tall, um, if you don't contact them, are you getting the same relative reading? And in the case we were just talking about comparing TVS diodes, you would want to use the, the where you where you've got a clear landing space on the trace as your reference point or reference of comparison. So let's see. Uh, Kim says, can you get some slides regarding TVS comparisons? Yes. Yes. We can. Uh, we can. You guys send me a note, and uh, I can I can send you some more slides on uh, doing that comparison. Um, is that a? I mean, you know, for the general audience here, is that something that um, you guys are having trouble with? Is getting a good qualitative and quantitative comparison of of different PVS diodes? Because that's that's something that this is really handy for. It's hard to ask the group a question. Oh wait, there's more. Wait, did we get another one? Oh, that's.
that's interesting. So wait a minute. There's a question on 26 here. What simulation tool? This is not a simulation tool. This is a measurement. I guess that's the key here. This is kind of the the oscilloscope equivalent to you know if if a O scope is to spice as scanning is to HFSS or something like that. So you're not you're this is not a simulation. This is actually what happened. And the key is here: does it match what you would simulate if you could do a full you know 3D field solver in the in the case? And um, you know the question at that point is really uh, since we know what the limitations are as far as orientation and what have you, but the question is, does the simulation match? This is the reality. And you know, just like your scope, your scope is not necessarily the waveform that you're measuring. It's got certain bandwidth limitations and, and probing impedance issues. So this is this is simply a, a, a two-dimensional <coughs> scope. You know, that you're you're looking at a large grid of measurements. So um, I think the other problem with this technology is that there's, uh, until you've actually seen it work on your system, uh, it's hard to tell, you know, what, what utility you could put it to. But um, in pretty much most cases, when people see it, um, they start finding new ways to utilize it. So it should be more, uh, more prevalent. Okay, yes, you can. Okay, so Richard asks, uh, the example as you show is on the board level. Can it also be used to scan on the chip level, and what is the resolution? So the resolution is dependent on step size, which the, the device we have can do 500 microns steps, and then the probe geometry, which is related to the bandwidth of it. So a smaller probe um, it will will be able to, to resolve more detail, but um, it won't, it has a different bandwidth than, uh, you know, a five millimeter probe. That said, you can see, um, we, we have found places on chips where, you know, the IC designers go back and say, oh, that's, that's the RAM area, you know, and so, you you can see quite a bit of detail at least on you know you're not going to isolate traces out but um, you can certainly see like we showed on the substrate for the VGA uh, you can definitely tell pins at the chip level and uh, but but this is intended for um, the the system level you know primarily uh, and and the interaction between chips. But you can definitely, you know, it depends on what you're looking for, and uh, really, the the uh, there's no way to predict exactly what you can find out about this stuff before you actually run it. But it only takes, you know, an hour to run a scan for some of these things, and uh, it's pretty. You don't have to have the device powered. I mean, it can be, but it doesn't have to be operating. In susceptibility scanning, the system has to be operating. And it has to be able to recover. Um, so you have to have the tester program to reset the machine or power, cycle power or what have you. But with uh, current reconstruction, you just you know, it can be a completely dead board, and you can see what it what it does um, when you, when you yeah, strike. I have another question just uh, prior to Richard. Just oh, okay. Uh, Ming asks, is the ESD reconstruction done by EMC scanning? It uh, essentially, if you if you take an EMC scanner um, and you you take the essentially this is current reconstruction can be extracted from uh, data that you would get from an EMC scanner if you're if if you use a scope instead of a spectrum analyzer or you could do it with a spectrum analyzer but we're looking at time domain um, so yeah I mean it's a the scanning probe, and that's where all this this came from, is to reapply that robotic scan to new purpose. So, okay. I have a question here. Yeah. 
Uh, first, uh, for car and reconstruction, you take uh, ESD gun in your scanner and you just look at this time curves like you shown. But I didn't, didn't quite get how did you do the uh, susceptibility test and if it's needed to well, for a complete test. And the second question is, uh, so do you offer the scanning or do you offer equipment and I don't know, training software for this? So, what well, is your um, offer? so the, the, uh, the last question first is, I mean, what we're trying to offer is a service and or if you want the hardware, then we can train you on that too. Um, the hardware, people like uh, Amber Precision, that's that's the equipment that we use. They sell the, the boxes and they'll build you a custom unit for whatever you want to do. Um, the problem is that do if you've, you know, in an EMC lab, if, if you want to spin up to it, this can be a great tool to have in the lab. But generally, these kind of problems, I mean, don't justify a $200,000 piece of equipment for one or two problems that you have. So usually it's a service that you you need the scans, you need it quick, uh, you send the board out, and you get the data back. And that's that's primarily what, what we're looking at because we can set it up, program it, and make the tester fly, you know. Um, with, without any resources wasted on your time um, because you've got fixing issues to work on. And then uh, I forgot the other question. Uh, the other question was so how do you do the susceptibility test and if it's needed for a complete scan? So the susceptibility test is injecting the pulse into the probe as it's uh, scanned across the board. So. Um, in it's, it's susceptibility scanning is the opposite of EMI scanning, right? You're listening from the probe with EMI scanning to the board. With the susceptibility scanning, I'm injecting glitches uh, through EMI into the board that I know what they look like. And um, you don't need that if you have, if you have a, uh, a hard failure um, that's you already know which chip blew up. You you really don't really don't care about susceptibility at that point. You know that you've got okay, a Okay, so yeah. So uh, you inject your signal with a probe and where do you measure at the ports or with the same probe or what? Well, that's so okay, again, and you're inducing it. So it's not when I say inject, it's a it's an induced not a conducted uh, pulse. But with susceptibility scanning you're making a plot of, of how robust the system is at that point. So you, the output is whether or not the system hangs or fails its failure criteria. You don't actually probe, you're not, now you can look at stuff and you can say when this signal does this, that's a failure. But usually it's when, for example, if you're doing a router, you, you inject the pulse at 1 kV, and then you say ping the, de the device. And if it responds, then you say, OK, now I put 2 kV in. And you ping it again. And if it responds, then it's robust at 2 kV. And so you get to 4 kV, and the system hangs. So you say, OK, 3 kV is the highest that that point can withstand. So then I go to the next point, reset the system, and start over again. And that's how I make a susceptibility hotspot map. It tells me okay, at but, uh, what what is the what is the highest point this this system can withstand right here without upsetting. All right, but uh, if you're inducing some or if you're uh, using this uh, pulses or put this pulses into the system and look at the pings, so probably if the system doesn't answer, then it's already dead. Right. So, uh, do you need another board to continue your scan, or uh, well, what? That's if, and that's on, usually, on, your, on your scans, yeah, uh, usually there was uh, also like a uh, uh, map with higher temperature, like the pictures you show on this slide. 
So uh, it was looking like, okay, at this point it's more susceptible than at the other. I, with eye diagram you can look maybe, okay, it's closed a little bit or more, but with ping uh, example it's either alive or dead. How do you right. how can right. make this? Again, so you have to pick your failure criteria appropriately, and the question is whether susceptibility scanning is not intended. Uh, to, it's 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 strictly for soft errors. So if you are causing damage through, and and you also have to remember, there's no reason for you to be applying uh, pulses uh, over the ASIC, right? In the in the system level testing. You're going to be hitting the case when it's all assembled. So these are for induced pulses from you know EMI that that is injected into a trace. So you have a, a three volt signal level, and you get a little 500 millivolt glitch on top of that, and that causes a latch up, which in in the case, for example, may or may not be destructive. If it's destructive and it destroys the machine, yes, every time you hit that level, you're going to have to have a new board. But these are for soft errors where you just glitch it and it goofs up the PLL or something and the system hangs. And it's resettable. So you can either cycle the power and reset the latch up or you can cycle the power and reboot the system. Uh, if 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 you have if you're if you're trying to debug something where there's damage occurring, you're probably going to want to look at current reconstruction because that tells you about where how the discharge is handled. And does that make sense? Uh, it, maybe you don't have a lot of uh, susceptibility issues. I mean, some some devices, some systems will be mostly about susceptibility, and some will be about just hard failures. So. It just depends well, on what you're trying to do. Susceptibility to testing isn't that like more of a two-tier uh, test where you do the susceptibility where you find kind of the weak spots in the board and the system, but don't you have to kind of do a second-tier test to figure out where that originates from? Right. From outside and, the system? Right. And so you can, I mean, that's the the overlay where you take both of them together and look at it. But if you're, you know, once you get into a problem. You can, and you understand. Uh, I mean, um, if you know that it's a, for example, the the issue with the the um, uh, the, the little router that we show on page 26, it's still here. This is done strictly with current reconstruction. We we could have gone back through and and done susceptibility and said, aha, that little area is a hot spot. But the fact is, I mean, we could see it. And so when you see it, you say, "Okay, well, I'm going to try it." And so you you uh, you what what was solved with this was not adding TVS, but rerouting the board. So we essentially cut the trace that was going to the the Broadcom chip, and and that that um, residual pulse goes away and didn't cause any more trouble with that by rerouting the pulse. I mean, by rerouting the trace, the problem went away. So at that point you quit, right? So, so yes, there's, there's as you bury down into a problem, you want to use all the tools you can, um, but you don't always need to use both of them. Sometimes you can just see the problem and be done. I mean, as the system designer, again, that's the difference between owning the equipment and just having the service done is because you know pretty much all there is to know about your system and the board and we don't really know anything about it so we're going to do the scan and say well here's some uh, here's some things I would look into and you'd say well A, B, and C are meaningless but D I didn't think of you know and 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 then if if you still don't know then we can go back and do a susceptibility scan and say okay here's the overlay here's the Here's the susceptible points, here's the vulnerable points, boom. This is definitely one or two of the key areas you have to look at. Uh, Tim asked the question, field-induced pulses don't usually cause damage, do they? Um, that's probably 
true, except that I do remember a, uh, a radar jammer that blew up a detector diode in a radar detector once. Um, so you well, I was referring to your EMI type scanning. You shouldn't be able to, but uh, it is possible to. Um, uh, if you if you get the probe on a, 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 a specific trace that's coupled well, or you cause enough uh, with an E probe, so you can also inject it instead of a, a inductive probe. But you could you can charge up a and cause a secondary uh, reaction that'll that'll bang something. Or like you you know we were just discussing here, uh, if you get a latch up. If, if we do a, a ESD-induced latch up, that the power supply then crowbars the whole sure. chip, right? So um, that's that is a problem. I mean, you know, usually the susceptibility testing is is pretty innocuous, and you're you're not going to hurt it. Usually, uh, the current reconstruction, you you don't have to use anything higher than just turning on the devices to see the paths. So it can also be done at a low enough level that it's usually non-destructive. But all these things can end up blowing your your system, so you have to be careful. But usually, you know, you're you're you're, you're already dealing with uh, some failures from the ESD gun, so you know the risk. When you when you do when you do one of these jobs, uh, would you? typically have several boards that you can blow off, or is that not? Yeah, but not I mean, there's some extra boards very often. Right. There's, I mean, very rarely does, you know, when you're doing your first initial prototypes, you've got super valuable initial silicon that, that you probably don't even want to let out of the building, which is one of the, one of the pluses to buying the equipment yourself. If you, if you don't want to, you know, if you don't want anybody to see your, your, your secret sauce, then you've got to do it yourself, and uh, this is this is still the way to do it. But um, if you've only got one or two parts, you need to do a very low-level scan first with very um, wide steps. So you do a very large matrix, so that you're because you if you're doing a hundred points, that means you're going to do a hundred zaps, and it has to withstand that the whole time. So you, you want to minimize that until you know what the problem areas are and then just focus on that. Okay, we, we have time for one more question. Anybody have another one? I Really appreciate the opportunity today, and thanks for all the questions. And um, go uh, if you can. It's Pragma Design slash video is um, is the narrated video, and um, it kind of explains current reconstruction specifically. Um, it's it's a good good example. Um, and send me you know email to any other technical questions you have, and I'll I'll shoot you back some slides or what I can um, and if you want a example of what we're doing and you have a board that you would like to see see this done on let us know and we can we can hook that up so good appreciate your time yeah thanks everybody we appreciate you joining us and look forward to, to seeing you next time thanks a lot Bye. Thank you.